this one I'm curious on. I'm probably going to bail out on this one early because it's they're just going to repeat the same shit. And this guy does the same thing that Glenn Beck does, which is turn everything into a fucking ad. So by the end of this, he's probably going to get try to get us all in a timeshare that will defraud us out of our money like he did the lovely people of Indiana and why he and his wife ran off to Port-au-Prince or wherever they are. I know where they are. I just pretend not to care because I don't give a shit. All right. Uh, not this guy, obviously. Uh, boink, 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 boink. Uh, he's very sad. He's very sad because apparently he's going to uh, die without re realizing his dream of subjugating most of Central Asia. Um, and oh my God, there's a thing attached to a thing. This is it. This is the end. Putin just changed everything with this move and NATO can't do anything. Well, gosh, there's nothing they can do. Done. And I don't even know why you have to post a video then. If it's over, it's over, right? Why would you have to convince someone of something that's self-evident? And uh, maybe he just wants to dunk on, maybe, yeah, that's probably what's happening. For more on the latest offensive overnight. He said moron first. I didn't. He just said, this is more on the offensive. I this is a, this is Clayton Morris, offensive moron. Russia into Ukraine. I want to bring in former weapons inspector, Scott Ritter. Oh, okay. So you're going straight to a convicted pedophile. I didn't know he was in this clip. I don't pre-watch these things. Uh, so, so this guy is going to have on as his guest, a man who did two years for trying to fuck a, uh, a, an undercover police officer he thought was a 15 year old girl. Yeah. Scott Ritter dodged being, uh, in, you know, having an iced tea with Chris Hansen by about six months. A former U S Marine who's been watching this very, very closely over the past 20. Has he, he's been watching it closely like this. Does he, does he do that thing where he pulls his glasses down or does he pull the glasses up? Does he put on his readers? Four hours. And, and Scott, there's a couple of big move, moving pieces on this, right? Mm. We hear from NATO that looks like Bakhmut is about to fall. Is that what you heard? And also want to get... They, did they call you? You got... They, NATO called you? Get your perspective. There was a... Uh, the, one of the NATO commanders said there's a possibility it might. That's it. On the use of... And, it didn't, and then it didn't. Hmm. of the aircraft to hit these targets that was something that you were targets oh you mean you mean human beings cool we're wondering about for many many months when would we see the ramping up uh, of aircraft be striking these targets so first to Bach. yeah we, uh, you guys have both been waiting for a long time when is when is russia just going to start bombing civilians god damn it i can't keep this semi going for long mood um, and this looks like it's about to fall. Do you agree with that assessment? And what does that portend for the rest of the war? Well, I'm always hesitant uh, when people say it's about to fall, especially. You mean because you've said multiple times it was about to fall and you've been eating your own asshole for months? Actually, something that's being defended as heavily as this is being defended. You know, uh, President Zelensky's come out and contradicted everybody from Lloyd Austin to Zeluzhny and, and um, everybody in between. Uh, and said no buck move. Scott Ritter, author, columnist, convicted pedophile. I don't know why that didn't make the list. I mean, it seems like it's it's what he's it's largely what he's known for. It is of strategic importance, and that we are going to be doing everything we can to hold on to Bakhmut. Um, and I think you're going to see the Ukrainians, um, you know, sending uh, some carefully hoarded reserves to Bakhmut. Carefully hoarded reserves. I don't know if he means gear or people. I don't think he means anything. I think he's just trying to dazzle Clayton with words. Because as Zelensky said, uh, if Bakhmut falls, it basically opens up um, the rest of the Donbass for Russian occupation. That Russia will begin rolling up the Ukrainian defenses. Because uh, Bakhmut was the, the... Yeah, that wasn't what he said. But they're talking about the entire region, not just Bakhmut. Yeah, if we lose Bakhmut, it's game over. Like, no one has said that, but okay. The Gordian knot that held this, you know, extensively uh, entrenched defensive line uh, together and the Solidar Bakhmut complex. And when Bakhmut. The Solidar. Okay, Solidar. Uh, hold on. Does he mean Volodar? I mean, he's an expert. What do I know? Sure, start the word with a F, an S instead of a V, whatever. Goes 
there's a straight shot to Kramatorsk. You can roll up the left and right flanks, and Ukraine won't have uh, the forces necessary to contain the Russians, and that'll begin the gradual unraveling of the Ukrainian defenses. This mm -hmm. totally could be because. And by the way, um, if I may, hold on. Let me see. Hold on. Let's. Can can I? Can we have a moment of how dumb this dumb? Okay. Let me see. Um. Bak, whoops. Bakhmut. Uh, map. Um, let's see if I get one in here. Where the fuck? All right, it's, it's just the herbal. Hold on. Um, uh, That's the this critical threats right here. I'm trying to find a close up of it. Um, mapping the battle for yeah, here you go. This is the infographic. Let's blow this up. Is this any bigger? Nope. Russia's advance in Bakhmut. Where are we going? Okay, there we go. Green Russian claim. Okay, yeah. So this, I mean, this is pretty good. Let me see if I can blow it up a little bit. Get out of here. Uh, yeah, yeah. There we go. Okay, let's scroll this down. Okay, so here's here's a map of of kind of what's going on. There's August first, uh, October sixteenth, and January eighteenth. These are the spaces, or whatever. Now, if you'll notice, um, red area is full Russian, uh, um, uh, under Russian control. The, the red is before February 23rd, 20, this is before the attack, this is after. Um, the pink area right here is Russian forces have operated in or launched attacks against, but do not control this area. And the, um, where is it? The green area, Russia claims to control Ukrainian territory. So Russia says this, but the Ukrainians say, no, we actually have it. Um, and then the blue is a Russian counteroffensive part of it, and that's up north or whatever. They're not counting any of this. Most of what the fighting here is just white is Ukraine. And then the green areas are where Russia said they had it, and then they don't. And then, pay. okay, so this is, but this is the closest one to here. And basically, you've seen this. They claim to have it, and now they don't. This is hardly a, a, a march forward at all. Secondly, does anybody recognize that, hold on, let me even shrink this down a little bit, minus a little bit, that makes it too small, but you get the idea. You see the way the land is laid out here? Does anybody think that grabbing this area right here specifically gives you this whole area? Which, by the way, this is Belarus up here. No? No? Nah, that doesn't... Uh, hmm. Or the, uh, Sorry, this is Kharkiv, which now is blue. There's the blue area. Is now the uh, uh, in the Ukrainians' control entirely. And by the way, this is also Ukrainian, but they don't make the whole thing blue, so it's easier. To, it looks more topographical. Um, as far as the counter strike and going back, does, does anybody think that this little bubble right here, that's this big se town of 70,000 people suddenly gives them all of this takes back Kharkiv or whatever. It's just weird. Like the assertion is just, it's just dumb. Um, you know, the Kursk of this conflict, I mean, one of the, you know, one of the more decisive battles of or the decisive battle of this, of this war. So, um, you know, and if the Ukraine and, and the other thing people need to understand is that um, also no, if they took back Kharkiv and Kherson the way they did, the idea that somehow you lose Bakhmut, you lose the whole thing, is just dumb. Especially when the the Ukrainians are getting newer and better materials, aren't losing soldiers as fast as the Russians are, and the Russians are running out of munitions. Derp. You know, this isn't the United States versus Iraq. I'm not denigrating Iraqi manhood. I'm, I'm not. But the Iraqi army was not of the caliber. They couldn't stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the United States. Uh, the Ukrainians are extraordinarily brave, extraordinarily well-trained, and for the most part, extraordinarily well-led. They're very well-equipped. They're putting up a heck of a fight. Um, it's not me that's saying this. Uh, but, yeah, I'm not saying this because I'm not allowed. Grosian, the, the head of Wagner, uh, speaks in glowing terms about the... 
Oh yeah, you guys used to kid fuck together, right? The quality of Ukraine. In your time in Russia? Why don't you spin yarns about that, you fucking creep? Ukrainian soldier that his men face on the battlefield. And he, uh, he calls them heroes. Um, and the reason why I bring that up is that they're the ones killing his guys. You know, when you when, when pe people hear, oh, you know, Bakhmut's getting ready to fall, you you might it might create the image of a defeated enemy. The Ukrainians aren't defeated; right. they're fighting. Uh, they're fighting hard. The, the the casualty level that they've taken is unreal, and the fact that they continue to uh, throw it's very real. Throw themselves into this battle. You know, the last time we yeah, that's the difference. They throw themselves into this battle, and the Wagner Group throws random Russians into this battle. Saw a military that was able to absorb these casualties and continue uh, to, to, to double down and, and, and press forward was during World War II with the Soviet Army, the Red Army, which suffered unbelievable casualties, but continued was able to fight. The Ukrainians are suffering, proportionally speaking, casualties that are the equivalent of what the Soviets lost during World War II in a, in a period of time. They've, they've lost in a year. Debatable. What we lost, the United States lost in terms of combat casualties for all of World War II on board. Yeah, but but Russia has lost, again, what, 20 times what they lost in Afghanistan in a decade in less than a year? Pacific and European fronts. So this is, this is Scott Ritter, convicted, convicted pedophile and former member of the IAEA um, inspector group, who, interestingly enough, was assigned to Russia, lived there for a few years as kind of the, you know, on-site dangling member of the IAEA and then came back with a lot of funny ideas about how the sun shines out of Putin's ass and, and America's terrible and uh, and yet he lives here or someplace around here, I suppose, in his parents' house, someplace 500 yards or further from a, a high school, that's for sure. Well, um, you know, in General Cavoli, the, the commander of U.S. forces and the Supreme Allied commander uh, in Europe recently said in a defense forum in, in uh, Sweden, that the scope and scale of the violence taking place on the battlefield today is beyond the imagination of NATO. NATO is not ready to fight this fight. Well, the Ukrainians are fighting this fight. What? This fight. And so I think even though Bakhmut might be ready to fall, it's only going to fall after much more hard fighting. It's a very difficult fight against a very um, capable and determined enemy. Yeah. It, it, notice how he's... His whole thing, and and I mean, he's definitely letting the air out of Clayton's balloon right now. And, uh, but he's been saying like, ah, they're gonna oh, they're gonna be taken any month now. Should we like? I don't want to look at any more Scott Ritter in the world than I have to. But do we want to go back to fucking May when he was like, this is this will be over in a week? Um, it's it's not going to be easy. Um, you know, it's too bad. Uh it's a. By the way, is it weird that he's talking like he wishes it would be easy for Russia? Held out now since May, and um, it, it could hold out. Yes, back when you were wrong again for the ninth time in a row. In another day, two days, three days, a week, um, depending on the tenacity and the uh, dedication of the Ukrainian defender, which to date has been, you know, of a very high level. So um, we'll see. But if once it falls, I think Zelensky's right. I mean, the Ukrainians have overcommitted to the battlefield, to, to Bakhmut, they've suffered. <laughs> does he realize, in the chat room, Leather uh, Goddess Bobo says, does he uh, realize that the USSR losses of World War II were actually in Ukraine? No, he does not. I mean, he knows materially, but he doesn't make the connection. Tremendous casualties. They burned up their reserves. And when the battlefield ends, understand that when Bakhmut goes, you're taking if. a frontage and you're potentially ballooning it out. And the Russian... No, you're not. Again... Look at this fucking map. What are you talking about? This is it. This is the, in this whole thing, it's this little piece right here. It, what about this part up here? Kharkiv, the whole part. Or how about down in the bottom, Kherson? The entire area that they've taken over a bunch of times. So they could take those back with strategy and, and fortification and fighting and, and new gear and all this stuff. They, they can get a bunch of new gear from NATO and other allied countries and everybody who's supporting them in this fight. And they can't take back Bakhmut because this, if they lose this right here, that's the turning point. Fucking please. By the way, this is the same guy who told you that when the Russians retreated from Kharkiv, they were actually doing a strategic withdrawal so that they could take it over again in less than a week. Russians have the force. Yeah, that fucking dumb.
pieces to Now, I don't know where the part about the airplane with the big Putin stopped everything. Into that we'll see that maybe. And, and fill the line. The Ukrainians don't have the forces capable of containing that balloon. Right now, the Ukrainians are concentrated in Bakhmut, but when, if, if the Russians balloon out, the Ukrainians won't have the forces capable of containing that. So you might see Ukrainians compelled to do withdrawal similar to what, if you remember back in September when the Russians withdrew from Kharkov, you know, because they were ballooned out, they didn't have sufficient forces, Ukrainians penetrating, the Russians had to fall back on a more concentrated defense line. You could mm -hmm. see. Yeah, it was very, it was very smart of them. Notice how that fallback, it was a way of winning. If the, if the Ukrainians fall back at all, it's, it shows weakness and they'll never be able to recover. This happening to the Ukrainians where they are going to be compelled to give up significant territory, probably in the north, to fall back on a defensive line that's shorter and uh, enabled to be. Why? Be, um, you know, be able to he be held in a more comprehensive fashion. So I'm not used to watching these kind of videos without uh, um, Russian media monitor doing a translation. Oh. I think Zelensky is 100% correct. If, if Bakhmut goes, I think you're... How strategically getting your ass handed to you. Got it? Okay. I got it. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, uh, that's more tactical, isn't it? It's very tactile. Is this your ass? Why, yes, it is. Thank you very much. But they, thank, you for, thank you for hanging on to it for me. You're going to see the rapid unraveling of the Ukrainian army in the Donbass uh, region. Um... Hmm. I don't think Clayton is as excited about that answer as he'd hoped to be. He was, you were, you, you recognize like, this is the deal. I'll have you on, even though you're a convicted pedophile. And you tell me that Russia is going to win this easily. And the minute they win Bakhmut, this whole fucking thing is over. Deal? Deal. And then that of course means as you talk about it, what is left of the Ukrainian army at that point after Bakhmut? Yes, nothing. Yeah, there are no fronts ever. They're all in Bakhmut. There's nobody in the surrounding territories. The only reason the Russians aren't um, steamrolling across the rest of the country is just because the, the it's watermelon season and they're having a seed spitting contest. Mood. And you're seeing NATO allies ramping up the uh, the rhetoric about additional weapons. Um, a no, no, no. They're not. They're ramping up the actual weapons. They're actually ramping them up onto trains and the trains are actually driving them into the country and then they're taking them off there with a ramp and then they're ramping up to running over Russians, apparently. Additional monies flowing into Ukraine. Marine Le Pen, uh, former presidential candidate in France over the past- Oh, you mean the uh, white supremacy candidate, her? 24 hours saying, if we continue to send weapons into Ukraine, that this would could wind up as a hundred years war. <laughs> uh, good, it'll be just in time for the launch of her uh, Fourth Reich. Uh, with a continued dripping of weapons and money into this zone. So, okay, for the record, if we keep pouring money into this, it will drive back the Russians to their original borders and stop what has been at least an eight year plus war. Right? In the, in the ongoing fighting in the Donbass, one of these never ending wars, isn't there's two ways to end a war? You know, you know how everybody's saying, uh, you know, Trump got never started a war and he got us out of all these wars, which he didn't, but whatever, you know, and the Biden, you know, the, the Democrats want to get us in these forever wars. Meanwhile, Putin's getting himself into a forever war. He started this shit, right? He's still technically not at peace in Georgia. They're still encroaching on land down there. That's a forever war. Right? Who will do the fighting? <laughs> Who's this dude doing the interview? Oh, okay. So this is Clayton Morris. He used to be on Fox and Friends a long time ago. And then he and his wife, um, I believe this, the, they scammed a bunch of people out of their, uh, out of their hard earned cash in a real estate swindle. And they were sued. I was going to say 12 or 21 properties, something like that. And they fled the country so that they wouldn't face uh, the lawsuits and the and criminal charges related to it. And so now he does an America Sucks podcast called Redacted in South America. And the this guy, this is Scott Ritter. He's the IAEA uh, former Marine who, uh, just like Matt Taibbi, um, lived in Russia for a good six, seven years at one fell swoop and then came back with a strange, odd need to bring down democracy in the United States and shit all over Western democracies. 
and defend Russia at every turn. And then if we know he's a convicted pedophile. I, I We've heard tell of the Russians, the Russians using compromise and blackmail to control people. I don't know if that's the case here. I probably, it's probably not. I mean, it would just be be Polish forces, U.S. forces. Who's going to be Ukrainian for who's going to be left to, to do the fighting there? Well, with all due respect to Marie Le Pen, and I know where she's coming from, her heart's in the right place. As a white supremacist, I guess, is that what you... All right. But her heart's in the right place. Up her ass, apparently. But, um, it won't matter. Um, I mean, right now, you know, the polls are bragging about how um, 10 of the 14... Um, uh, Leopard A4 tanks that were promised are now deployed into Ukraine. Ten tanks. Ten tanks. Ten tanks. Um, it's nothing. Plus, in order to support those ten tanks, um, the the Polish have to build a uh, logistics hub inclusive of a manufacturing capability for spare parts because they don't make spare parts for the tanks anymore. Um, or... Um, they could buy a lot of those spare parts from Germany, which they're doing, and install them in a modified space in Poland. By the way, uh, he does realize that the, the Ukrainians have gotten more tanks from Russia than any other source, right? Um, so the complexity of supporting 10 tanks, the, the amount of resources that have to be put in to keep 10... Yeah, I mean, like, like obviously the... The Russians can't even keep the tires inflated on their trucks. Imagine what, like the Ukrainians, they're basically Russian, so they're they're not they're going to use the wrong end of a left-handed monkey wrench. Tanks in the field is ridiculous. Uh, if there's a hundred plus coming, everybody is patting themselves on the back, like they're giving ten, you're giving ten, they're giving ten, and the idea is like we're going to get ours in there first. That's why. What France is going to what provide Leclerc tanks? How many? 14? No, they're eclair tanks. They're uh, they're pastry on the outside and cream filling. They're fabulous. Oh my god, they're so good. The same problem. The cannoli tanks from Italy will be uh, uh, arriving there. They're going to take the gun and leave the cannoli. I think. How do you support that? It's a completely <laughs> different support uh, requirement than the Leopard A4. We're going to provide 31 M1 tanks at some point in time. Right now, we're, we're basically, we're talking 60 tanks. 60 tanks is not going to turn this into a 100-year war. You, <laughs> Ukrainians are losing manpower, equipment, organizational structure, etc., at a rate far greater than NATO could ever replenish it. But the big factor is artillery ammunition, 155-millimeter ammunition that Ukraine must have to be um, competitive on the battlefield. Uh, yeah, and Russia uses... Um, months worth of missiles in one shot, and they're out. Even in a losing cause, to hold the Russians back, to slow their rate of advance, Ukraine must have artillery, and they are going to run out of artillery ammunition sometime this summer. And they're wait. Listen to that sentence one more time, and then we're getting out. Because fuck this dude. Ukraine must have artillery, and they are going to run out of artillery ammunition sometime this summer. And so Sometime this summer, they're killing Russians at a rate of 10 to 1. Some some say 30 to 1. Let's split the difference. 15 to 1 with the Ukrainians. Uh, and the Ukrainians are using artillery to just, like, obliterate these large swaths of these poor saps Russia is throwing into the meat grinder. And this asshole's big, like... Don't worry, relax, it's all going to be good. Russia's going to win because Ukraine's going to run out of 155 millimeter uh, uh, artillery shells by summer. It's fucking March. Good Lord. <laughs> so anyways, uh, in increasingly stupid and full of dum-dums.